Hey everyone, Mario Camardella with Servescape here. Uh, Anna from the CED reached out. She wanted me to answer a few questions about what we're doing here at Servescape. So I'm happy to jump in and share uh, some, of these, some of these answers with you. So it was late one night, I was studying for a final. I wasn't in the Bachelor of Landscape Architecture major yet. I was actually in education and I was, again, studying for this final, and it was late, and I run into my friend, Charlie Sears, the basement of Caldwell Hall. I found out from another friend that Caldwell Hall was a great place to study. Um, it was really quiet, so I was on the third floor, and went down to the lobby, was getting a Coke, ran into my buddy, Charlie Sears, uh, and I hadn't seen him in two years, but we graduated high school together. So he was telling me uh, that he was working on his final two, and I said, I said, well, I'm studying for my final. How are you working on yours? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm building a golf course model for my final. I said, it just blew my mind. I mean, that was a thing? What, what kind of major is this? So I said, can I see it? And he said, sure. So he got back on the elevator, went to the fourth floor, walked around this cavernous hallway, and the room like opened up. and. I, I just blew my mind because I saw uh, people in these large drafting desks with markers and, and exacto knives and people sleeping on couches and it smelled like a lot of chemicals from all these markers. And I just thought, these, these are my people. This is my tribe. And I knew right then and there that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in landscape architecture. So I stopped studying for that final, that education final, and talked to Professor Greg Coyle the next day and said, this is what I want to do. That's how I got to College of Environment Design and my path to landscape architecture. So many thanks to Charlie Sears and others helping me get there. Now, specifically on the food producing thing, I'd always had a passion for gardening. My grandmother had one, both my grandmothers, my, my mother, and um, we were always out in the yard digging up something and planting something and seeds and such. And I found so much warmth and, and value harvesting anything from the landscape, even very early on. Uh, throughout my childhood, I did Boy Scouts, and nothing was more fun than going on a camping trip and harvesting blueberries and making blueberry pancakes. So um, really having that respect and reverence for the land um, was one of the ways in which my path was guided to uh, doing landscape architecture and food producing landscapes. So it's been a year and a half since I left the city of Atlanta as the urban agriculture director. And in that time, I think a lot about the people. Um, we definitely, uh, you know, worked with some amazing communities and uh, low income, low access areas, you know, low access to a fresh uh, grocery store. But what we found in those areas was just an immense cultural pride, um, beautiful, smart, intelligent, creative, hardworking, and uh, just brilliant people. And when you're on a quest to bring fresh fruits and vegetables to a particular area, it's so important to understand why and who and where and all those other things, not just the what. And uh, the lasting um, impression that, that, that I hope that I left was um, that, that there are tools, there are things that are available for any community to to build the type of resilience that they need, especially within their food system. And, um, and a lot of that is just uh, enabling access, access to land or resources or, or this, that, and the other. And I hope, I pray that um, some of the work that uh, I was able to do with the community um, still enables that access. I was inspired to start Servescape because I wanted to bring that access to everyone. Um, when I was at the city of Atlanta working as an urban agriculture director, it was about enabling access for people that lived in low income, low access areas, um, uh, specifically. 
And right now, my boundary for doing, providing that access is much larger. And so I get to look at all of Metro Atlanta. Um, I want people to, at the tips of their fingers, click three buttons and have blueberry bushes delivered right to their door um, or their community or wherever uh, to a local park. I want to um, have access to these, so farmers have access to the marketplace that in three clicks a farmer can put their inventories online and give it to a customer or, or a homeowner or community um, very, very quickly. Um, I want to enable access and that's the, the, the root and reason for starting Surfscape. When we set out to start Servscape, it was designed to be a tool for uh, the commercial industry, for specifically design builders. That was our go-to-market strategy. Um, we knew that there was a lot of landscape designers out there that also do their installations. And I was one of those. When I started Urban Agriculture Incorporated uh, back in 2012, I really wanted a tool just like Servscape where I could get access to locally grown material and have it delivered. I didn't have a whole bunch of trucks or a whole bunch of employees or the money to pay for expensive delivery fees. So um, I built Servscape in mind for the design builder. However, when the pandemic came and we, uh, we, we had unique timing in that I worked uh, on the plant database and building Servscape for a year but prior to launch. And I told my wife when we were gonna, that we were, I was ready to leave the city of Atlanta to step down from, our, from the position and launch Servscape on March of 2020. Well, we were gonna make a big announcement. I invited all my friends. Um, and that week, the CDC had a bigger announcement that a pandemic was coming. So our big adjustment or pivot, as they say, um, was to um, was really by necessity because once the pandemic happened and all the physical garden stores closed down, we had a numerous amount of people emailing and wanting to get access that were homeowners. And after saying no a few times, more than a few times, um, we finally just said yes, let's do it. Let's open it up to homeowners. And that was the start of what you see today as Surfscape. I see landscape architecture really uh, changing in, in its intentions and its focus toward uh, ecological resilience. Um, the value that we put on landscapes um, are going to be so much more uh, in depth and expansive when we incorporate uh, ecological services into the mix, not just for beauty but for purpose and for reasoning um, that is beyond just a human component, but really look in taking into account the entire ecosystem. Yes, how we play into that ecosystem, but how the ecosystem touches everything around us. So I believe that landscape architecture has, the, the profession and the trade has a bright future when we embrace that we are stewards not just of the land of which we live in, but all things live in. My advice I would give to somebody, anybody that's entering the industry, it's not just young people, it's just anybody that's inquisitive and creative and hardworking. Those are all the attributes that you have to carry forward in anything you do. But specifically, especially in this economy, is be intentional with what the types of projects you want to work on. Associate, associate yourself with the people, the projects, and the places that you want to work on um, and be intentional with it. This, these are the types of things you want to do. And also understand what other trades or professions are, are adjacent and that you have to work with because nobody does this alone. You have to have a big team. Understanding these ad adjacent professions will enable you to empathize with your future teammates and also have a larger, more comprehensive understanding of how, um, how you can make positive change in the world. 
Hmm, what are some underrated plants in the landscape? I love, right now I, I'm really um, leaning toward a lot of sensorial things like lamb's ear. I think placed properly with, um, with a number of things, it just really, really sort of highlights a lot of little pollinator uh, perennial gardens. So sometimes in a butterfly garden, um, things don't have that um, sort of long-term uh, four season sort of feel. And uh, lamb's ear can give you um, really, really a base of color and texture um, all year round. So I'm really liking lamb's ear right now. Some of my go-to sources for inspiration and design are people that are are either approaching the edge of design or people that have just fallen off the cliff of design and trying to crawl their way back. What does that mean? Um, one of my favorite landscape architects is uh, Darmute Gavin out of Scotland. He just does these crazy uh, installations and all of them sort of intermixed with plants and sculpture and uh, just beautiful stuff and I, I just feel like he's just off the cliff and and then trying society is maybe trying to keep up or um, He's just out there and then some people that are really pushing the edge um, of this, this beautiful delicate thing of, of high design, but with some intentionality um, I really like some of the work that Brian Fields is doing with Fields Landscape Architecture who's a UGA alum and um, of course, Professor Brett Davis is doing some amazing work. Uh, Professor Alfie Vick is doing some amazing work, um, especially around the food forest sort of movement. So these are some of the people that I look at and I say, man, they're just, the process is amazing. Um, the, the, the product and the results look fantastic. And, you know, just learning from others in the field and creating that sort of camaraderie around sharing some of the, the challenges and uh, I think just makes everyone a whole lot better and I'm really grateful to have some great relationships with these folks. Uh, Anna, thank you so much for allowing me to um, chat with everyone today. Go dogs, go CED um, and remember to you know stay focused on the plants, the place, uh, people and the purpose. <laughs>